Good morning, good afternoon, TDU crew. Uh, welcome back to a, another season. Just before we get going today and I do my official intro, um, you'll probably notice that our beloved host and also our dear friend Andy is not with us today. Unfortunately, um, some very sad news came to both of us uh, about a week ago. Andy has lost his mother, Margot, um, last weekend. So he's just taking some time. Obviously, he's just had a little baby boy, Austin, as well. Um, he and his sister, Loz, uh, we're thinking of you. Um, we're also thinking of little Austin. We're thinking of Cash. And we're also thinking of all of Margot's extended family. So um, before, well, we just wanted to make that clear before we get going. Andy's still around. Um, but if you could show him some love in the comments, um, you know, he's doing really well. Uh, Alice has spoken with him. I've spoken to him via text, um, but sending our thoughts and wishes before we start today's show. Absolutely. Mar Margot is a, a woman we've, we knew for, for 20 years, a really good person, generous of spirit, always put up with our bullshit when we were underage drinking around the house and we'd just, you know, Definitely. have a little chuckle and enjoy it. And um, she's got two great kids in Andy and Loz, and I think... Um, her spirit will live on in them and the way they comport themselves forever. Um, she was stoic right until the very end, never complained about her health situation, loved spending time with her, her grandson, Ozzy, for the you know few weeks that she got. Mm. So, yeah, I, I echo your thoughts, Jack. We're thinking of Andy Cash and the family. We know the TDU crew will, will send their best wishes too. So may, may she rest in the everlasting peace that she deserves. Definitely. Yep. Vale, Margot. Uh, let's get the show underway. Herbert is being chased, thrown on the run, and it is caught. Touchdown, Keenan Allen. What a grab. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. That's the warrior spirit right there, boy. Huge sack by Joey Bosa. 90-yard touchdown. 90-yard touchdown! It's going to be picked off at the 8-yard line by Derwin James. Herbert sets his feet, takes a shot downfield, has Knighton. Caught! Touchdown, Chargers! That's the greatest throw I've ever seen. Yes, indeed. We are back for another season. How are you feeling, Al? Season three. Woo! And now, look, season three typically has not boded well for recent uh, Chargers head coaches. You know, Lynn, McCoy, yeah, Staley. So uh, a bit, a bit of pressure on us. I was uh, just thinking about, you know, how could season three blow up for us as, as a podcast? <laughs> like we, we start just like uh, getting angry in the comments at listeners when they ask completely reasonable questions. Uh, I don't know. What else do you reckon? We, we might start going at each other on Twitter being like, oh yeah, I know Alistair said that, but I don't truly believe that. We might start clashing in the yep. comments. Who knows? And I tell you what, there is some, uh, for the listeners who are really closely paying attention, you will notice that the intro video and audio is still from a couple of years ago. There are a couple of changes going on in the production background. We might need to remove one or two sound bites uh, for the, the long the long gone now, Brandon Staley, but that is all happening in the background. So whilst the intro video is still two years old or one year old, uh, it's season three. And, this and who's it. got it better than us? Nobody. Yeah, I know. I tell you what, it's um, it's been very exciting. Obviously, I've had a bit of hiatus from the show, so uh, I'm really excited to be back. Um, and obviously, as we noted in the show before, I've got big shoes to fill with uh, with Andy being away, but I'm sure he'll be back on deck with us sometime soon. Yeah. So today, I think, is going to be quite a sort of general discussion around the happenings and goings on of the last um, sort of couple of months. We're going to chat about the recent news. Um, we haven't really talked about our coaching hires just uh, sort of in depth as of yet. Um, we're going to sort of talk about a little bit of the roster, where we're sitting um, currently with our restricted free agents and free agents, um, structuring our players who are on big contracts, what we might do there. And then we're going to talk about some free agency stuff. So um, let's just get straight into it, I think. Yeah, uh, let's Alistair, do it. Yeah, what, what is the coaching hire or positional coach that you are perhaps most excited about or you're intrigued about or you're not too excited about? Let's start here. Yeah, we, we know the big ones like the offensive coordinators and the defensive coordinator, Greg Roman, we've got Jesse Minter coming across from Michigan, Harbour sitting at the top. 
But when you're digging down the list, one that kind of catches my eye is the new wide receivers coach, Sanjay Lal. He's a 54-year-old guy who actually played college wide receiver himself. He won a national title with the Washington Huskies in the early 90s. And he's been an NFL wide receivers coach for 15 seasons. Raiders, Jets, Bills, Colts, Cowboys, Jags. But most recently, the last few years, he's been with the Seattle Seahawks. And I look at the blueprint for DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett as mm. potentially being something that QJ, who had some rookie year blues, would be hoping he can emulate. I mean, DK Metcalf, Calf, when he came out, was a guy who was thought to have ha had a limited route tree, just running a lot of goes and slants, maybe similar, some f like athletic attributes like Quentin Johnston. So I think that might be a sneaky under the radar hire, hire that could really augur well for Quentin Johnston coming into year two. Yeah, let's be careful not to compare DK Metcalf or Quinton Johnson. Uh, DK Metcalf is probably one of the most developed beasts that I've ever seen in my life. He's like, yeah, I'm 21 years old. Mate, you're like a professional bodybuilder. What an absolute unit. Uh, that's a good one, actually. I had, I had considered that. I was going to sort of start a little higher at the top with the hiring of Jesse Minter. I found myself a little more akin to looking at what the defense might look like based on the tape from Michigan. I don't really know what the offense is going to look like. You can throw your mind back to what Harbour and Roman were doing at the 49ers, but they've never really had a, a sort of an, a, a, quarter, a quarterback like Justin Herbert. So yeah. um, I just did a bit of deep diving into Minter and, you know, he's had... Uh, we well, had four years in Baltimore and then he went to Vanderbilt where he was the DC. And then he obviously replaced Mike McDonald at Michigan when McDonald went to Baltimore. So this guy's got a bit more of a coaching resume perhaps than a Brandon Staley has. He's got a little bit more experience. He's got both, um, let's call it Harbour experience because, mm -hmm. you know, yes, you're coaching in the NCAA, but you're with, you're with Harbour. Um, and he's also got that, that Baltimore experience as well. And then I sort of, I was, you know, I was thinking that are we going to play a four two five? I think that's kind of what the Michigan offense kind of looked like, or there was some, um, you know, that's what they played roughly what I could identify anyway. Um, but then, you know, thinking about the roster and where it stands is that the, the Ojabo and Hutchinson before Ojabo tore his Achilles, I think was a really good experience too. premier pass rushes. And I think maybe Aiden Hutchinson's going to be what Joey Bosa, what we hope Joey Bosa would be for the Chargers. Um, you know, and then, and then I kind of look at it and go, well, the last couple of years um, has been a pass rush by committee as well. And they've really focused on that top end coverage, um, single high, double high, and then elite quarterback play. So it's that adaptable system. And I'm really worried about saying that because that's kind of what I said about Brandon Staley's system as well and what he's going to bring. But um, Brandon Staley didn't have Jim Harbour. So Mint is that young mind. He's also got his um, his mentor in, in, in Harbour there. So super exciting to see what the, what the defense does. Yeah. And I think building on what you said, what you, you can see whenever you turn on the tape to watch Michigan, which, which I've been doing recently for some draft prep, is the way they all communicate clearly and seem to know the scheme and what they're doing. And if you listen to some of Minter's press conferences and his intro one as DC, it seems like a very clear communicator, belief in teaching the principles of the system rather than just the plays. Now, and if you if you if if we start seeing that the cornerbacks are lined up in zone and we're thinking this looks a bit like Staley, expect that because they do like to play a lot of zone coverage on the back end. But I think what we should expect to see is definitely more simulated pressure mm. uh, and more games up front and a little higher blitz rate. So I, I'm excited about that high man. And a couple, a couple of the other things um, I've noticed in this coaching staff, we have a few kind of X charges or charges coaches returning. So maybe do you want to comment on, we've got Nick Hardwick who's come back as an assistant O-line coach and we see Shane Day return, mm. perhaps at the request the of Justin. Source. Yeah, the secret sauce to Justin Herbert's chili, or should I say brisket? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, Shane Day is the other one that I was going to touch on. Um, you know, Herbert had one of his best years under Shane Day. 
pretty much a calming influence. We've heard him speak a couple of times, nothing new there. But Nick Hardwick is an interesting one, sort of media personality, uh, very vocal on social media and as a sort of a, a colour TV personality. Fascinating to see what he's going to bring in. Um, X centre which is what we like. So uh, we know that Lindsley is going to, well, the chances are that he's going to retire. So a Hardwick-Lindsley pairing, keeping them in the organisation, two top tier centres. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see if they uh, go for some centre guard in the early on in the draft to sort of shore up that position speaking my language mm. yeah and he's a guy who always just played played with such passion and who knows maybe that connection with philip rivers we can get phil back to the charges in some capacity in the future i don't know calling plays he might freak justin herbert out a little bit he's yeah. pretty in, they're kind of like chalk and cheese one's extremely competitive oh no sorry i should they're both competitive but one's quite calm the other one golly Gosh darn it! it might, yeah, screaming might, on the sideline. Yeah, it might blow the headset. Um, so I just wanted to ask you as well, Alistair, with uh, Minter coming through, and then perhaps how Harbour runs teams. Are we going to see a different approach to team construction? You said that it's it is a pass rush. I sort of looked at it pass rush by committee. Um, you said simulated pressure. There's also quite a lot of um, rotations through the defense yeah. to try and keep them fresh. So are we, and, and that's kind of antithetical to how the current roster is constructed with, you know, premier guys at every position and they stay on the field is, is, uh, and I guess that's going to lead maybe into our discussion later, mm, but mm. How, how do you, how do you see that working? Is that, is that a philosophy that you think Harbour is going to bring with his, and with his coordinators as well? I think you've hit the nail right on the noggin because, because if you look at the Baltimore system and even Michigan to an extent, it is, it's, it's very much athletic rushes who maybe they're a little undersized and he likes to drop them into coverage more perhaps than players of the the stature and size of Bozer and Mack would be comfortable doing. You're looking at guys like Van Noy and Jadavion Clowney fitting well in, in Baltimore. So I wouldn't be surprised if they actually don't mind approaching Edge as a bit of a committee, as you say, because they find a way to generate pass rush with blitzing. They usually have good big interior guys, like we've seen Justin Matabuike mm. just get the bag in Baltimore. Yeah. So I think you could be onto something, something to, yeah, to okay. see. And do you have any um, comments around Bowman, Navarro, uh, coaching the Ooh, linebackers? Ooh, is, is that, that a, exciting? Yeah, is that, that that's kind of an interesting one as well. well any, any thoughts on that? Hasn't coached really properly at any level in terms of in a formal positional coach role. So that's the downside risk. But we've, we've talked about this before and we did back um, when Ronaldo Hill was the defensive coordinator for the Chargers. I think it helps to have just one or two guys in your coaching staff who've played at the NFL level. And was there more than, you know, were there more than three more fun, intense linebackers to watch in the, you know, mid 2000s than or early 2010s, the Navarro Bowman, I'd say no. He was really the heart and soul of that 49ers defense along with Patrick Willis. So God, he's going to bring something to the room. And when you look at young guys like Dayon and, you know, Nick Neiman, that's going to be a real boon for them, having just this veteran linebacker to help out and communicate to the players the way players like to receive Minter's message. I wonder if there's an element of linebacker coaching, and I don't mean to diminish linebacker coaches, but it is just pure, just trying to train instinct, a lot of it, because it is such a reactive position. You have to be so fast. Whereas the defensive line, I guess, is, you know, the edge have the technique, they have their stunts, they have their sets. The back end are looking at coverage. Clearly communication is really important there, but it seems that linebacker, the best linebackers anyway, and I think of Keekly, I think of Bowman, I think of Willis, they seem to have this great tactical knowledge, but then there's also, there's just pure instinct that they play. They can read it very, very quickly. And we haven't really had one of those on the charges for quite a long time so have perhaps having that veteran there and he clearly knows harbour from his time in san francisco i think they crossed paths they were there for a bit so um and, and maybe what happens with kenny murray who knows but i think getting henley uh amen ogbong even for a little bit and as you said neiman these physically gifted athletic guys let's just remove the the strategy for a bit and let's just focus on what they have, which is which they're physically gifted. Fascinating. Now, Fascinating. now what I think we've got to hope is, I think when Navarro Bowman was playing in the league, linebacker was a little easier as a position to play than it presently yeah. is. Less of the RPO, college concepts, constant conflict. 
Um, so hopefully Minter can help them with some of the schematic things that Bowman might be like, well, offenses weren't doing this to me. And Bowman can get them juiced up and like yeah. hit them, get them in terms of their psyche to play the position. Yeah, I mean, it's such a tough position to play. I mean, we've been pretty harsh and people are pretty harsh on Kendricks and Kenny Murray. But geez, I tell you what, in today's game, I don't think I'd want to be an off-ball or middle linebacker because that's one of the hardest positions on the defense. Uh, anything else do we do we want to touch on um, that, that popped out to you on the coaching roster? Just good to see a lot of guys who have have previous experience as either offensive coordinators or head coaches. Mark Tressman is a senior offensive analyst and he was the head coach for the Chicago Bears and in the CFL. Uh, Marcus Brady, who's the pass game coordinator, he was a Colts OC. So uh, it just looks like a way, way more experienced staff than Brandon Staley ever had. And I think that's the attraction of getting a guy like Harbour who has got 20 years of contacts to draw from. And hopefully that leads to better overall coaching on the on the team. I think my last one, and I think this is possibly the most important one, is that the continuity on special teams. And I'm going to say... We almost forgot Fick and Fick and Fick. We did. Fick and Fick and Fick. I have a feeling that he's going to be the Chargers' next offensive coordinator, and I think he'll be a head coach within six years. Because okay. now he has... He's been with, he was with Zimmer for a long time at the Vikings. And now he's transferred over. He's got a year of seeing what, a couple of years of seeing what a brand new coach can do and the pitfalls. Um, and not he's do been it able yet. To, <laughs> Yeah. He's been able to survive the axe, which tells me something that perhaps he's a little more political. Uh, clearly also his special teams unit, he took it from being one of the worst in the league to one of the best. So he can walk the walk. Um, and perhaps he can talk the talk a little bit. He understands the, the backroom politics that you need at that organizational level. Now he gets one of the best head coaches uh, in recent memory that we've had at the Chargers to learn from. You've got to think, you don't know how long Greg Roman's going to be around. Um, so I have this feeling that if I'm the Spanoses, is that I've picked out Ryan Fiken, Ficken, Fuken to be our next offensive coordinator. And who knows, down the track, who knows, could be elevated when Harbour has won his three rings to the head coach position. That would be my take. And that's a very longitudinal and sort it's of meta forward. It's Love very it. meta, but, um, but good on him. I, I think that to survive what's happened there, there's got to be something that he's doing that is bang on. Well, you've uh... heard it here first, TDU crew, Jack. Does, <laughs> he doesn't just want Vic and a special teams coordinator. He's going to be offensive coordinator, maybe defensive coordinator too, and future head coach of the LA Chargers. <laughs> Bold up. We're talk but we're talking in five, six years hmm. time here. We're not talking like next year, but by then he'll have 15, close to 15, 20 years in, in the NFL. And that's your prime candidate for um, either being poached by someone or being elevated internally. Uh, let's talk about any press conferences. I know we're sort of, we're, we're on this train of, of coaches. My first one is that, gosh, isn't the energy from Harbour, both of them, that, that one that we saw is just insane, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you can tell they just love their dad and he's been the major role model in their lives. And of course, you're referring to that video that came up on the Chargers YouTube channel with Jim and John Harbour sparring and sharing Harbourisms. And you can even see how much Jim looks up to his older brother, John. Yeah. And they're a football family and, and they love the game and they love coaching. It's it's all the feels right now. It's a good time to be a Chargers fan. And, and that was great content if you haven't listened to it yet, Teddy Ucru. Yeah, the... Um... I'll tell a little story and I try not to be too long. When I was working in wine, I always thought, and wine is all about knowledge and wanting to expel knowledge to the customer. And the more that you talk, perhaps the more knowledge that you have and the better sommelier that you are. Now, if I'm looking, and what I started to learn as I worked, as I worked in wine, um, and now I kind of use it as a bit of a mantra to life. Sometimes the people who speak the most, yes, they might control the air, but they actually might be the most... Uh, the least knowledgeable. And so when I compare what I hear with Harbour versus Staley, Brandon was like, knowledge, 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 knowledge. And then Harbour was just like, so what do you think of the game? So yeah, it was good. That's it. And so I'm kind of thinking it's kind of nice to have that back. Um, Lynn was quite good at it. McCoy was McCoy. Uh, so yeah, that, that's definitely this feeling that I got. And I'm not going to read too much into press conferences now because we did it with Brandon Staley. Look where that got us. Yeah. Uh, salary cap. Let's talk about it. Yeah, do you, I can hit on some roster items here. So uh, the league announced that the 2024 cap will jump from 
$1.5 million to $255.4 million. This was unexpected and uh, is a consequence of some TV deal money hitting the NFL coffers. Swift and what money. that actually <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're spot on. Um, and what that does is helps the Chargers naturally solve some cap problems because they it probably is the difference of maybe one decision one play you were going to cut and now you don't it's just some extra money and what this is is some keynesian economics in play we'll get to see play on it's a bit like the stimulus packages around the gfc you hand out some extra money to people and what are they going to do with it are they going to spend it and put it back into the economy or are they going to put it straight into their bank accounts to to save it for a rainy day so it will be interesting to see some of these new free agent external free agent contracts their player agents are going to say, hey, the, the cap's gone up, so so should contracts of players throw more money because you've got more money to spend. But I expect it could have the opposite effect, especially for the Chargers who were in the red. Now that just gives them kind of a clearer pathway to cap compliance. So that's one of the the items you you alluded to alluded to it earlier, Jack. Corey Lindsley's helped the team really by renegotiating his deal. It lowers his 2024 contract base salary cap hit. And what that essentially confirms is that he's going to be a post-1 June retirement. And it really just helps the charges out. It gets them a couple of extra million dollars uh, to work with there. Uh, and I'll throw to you in a second. Eric Hendricks also has been cut. Now, that saves $6.5 million to the roster this year, to the cap. So that was one that was, I thought, quite quite obvious based on where he's at in his career. But any observations, Jack, on on those kind of three items? Not really. I mean, the salary cap jump is fine. It probably is. Is it larger than other years? I don't know. I don't know the data on that. Is it? Is it more than what we what they expected? It is. It's it's a kind of a small but significant increase on what was expected. And as these things continue to increase, it's currently the highest it's ever been in the league. Yeah, okay. And I, listen, I think Eric Kendricks is, is fair enough. And, and everyone knows my opinion that we should need to keep Corey Lindsley in the building as a coach because I think he's obviously clearly one of the smartest and best centres uh, in the last sort of number of years. Um, did you want to yeah. move on to the ERFAs? Yeah, and so the last kind of move of the last three days or moves, uh, the Chargers have tendered two exclusive rights free agents. Now, what that is, is, is it's a player who has kind of three or less years of service and teams get control over them to place essentially a tag valued at the league minimum. In this case, it's $985,000. And what that d does is that's going to be their salary for the 2024 season. The Chargers had five exclusive rights free agent candidates. Cameron Dicker, offensive tackle Foster Sorrell, safety Raheem Lane, wide receiver Keelan Doss, and guard Zach Bailey. And they have tended two of those five. They've tended Cameron Dicker, which is a no-brainer. To have him for $985,000 next year was is great value. I suspect they might even look to extend him on a long-term deal at some stage this offseason. The other one is uh, Foster Sorrell, which is perhaps... Less intuitive, Jack. Um, and the other three, I should just say, the team has until the 13th of March. They could place uh, tags on the other three, but I imagine they would have done it now if that was their plan. So that doesn't mean those guys are not on the team. They could decide to sign them to contracts a little later on in the offseason, but the only ones they want to commit to at the moment are Cameron Dicker and Foster Sorrell. There must be something that Foster Sorrell has shown, whether it's athleticism or the fact that he's the rotational piece behind Pipkins and Slater now. He's that swing tackle. Uh, they they feel that they've got to shore that up with some guy who's got some NFL level experience. That's the only thing that I can think of. Lane was a Staley guy. Doss really didn't show much. And Zach Bailey, I mean, had some good games. Uh, well, maybe not good games, but let's say good snaps or good series. But that makes sense. Again, they're all sort of... They're all sort of these patchwork guys. Like even even Kendricks to an to a point is, is a patchwork guy. Bring him in if and they're going to add to perhaps taking the team over the top, which didn't happen. So nothing surprising there. Uh, the biggest surprise clearly is that speaking of Brandon Staley, is that he's been named the 49ers assistant head coach. Is that kind of a sideways step or is it a demotion? Because I would feel like a demotion is an offensive coordinator but they they have more clout than an assistant head coach. So is this a little bit of a, a, a Brandon? It's okay, you know, you're gonna need to just recover a little bit, and you can just sort of sit in my in my little pocket. Here's here's my here's my pocket, Brandon. 
Here's my pocket, Brandon. Hold it. You know. <laughs> I, mate, I, you, you speak in my language. I think he he's had probably the worst 12 months of any coach in the NFL. I mean, after he got fired, he interviewed unsuccessfully for the Dolphins defensive coordinator role, the Packers defensive coordinator role, the Rams defensive coordinator role. And then he interviewed for the 49ers defensive coordinator role. And they decided, no, we're going to give it to an in-house guy, but you can be the assistant head coach, whatever that means, which kind of Anthony Lynn was a couple of years ago. So I think, I think it's probably better than a position coach, better than him being linebacker coach for some Correct. team. But it's it ain't a DC role. He's going to have to bide his time. Yeah, gosh, um, how the mighty have fallen. Uh, Tranquil receives three years from the Chiefs. You know that made me. It makes it's a bit sickening seeing him on social media. How happy he is and how amazing. But good on him, Drew Tranquil. He he he. To be honest, he gave some of his best years at the Chargers. I thought, and and he really developed. And he went through that sickening broken leg injury. Oh, yeah. Um, which was which was gruesome to watch, uh, and all the power to him. But I mean, it's not a huge deal, right? Was it thirteen million guaranteed, three years for nineteen? Um, Good money like for him. Yeah, mm. it just kind of makes him around about you know top fifteen highest paid linebacker in the league, or just at the fringe of the top fifteen. And he earned it. He, you know, watching the Super Bowl, he definitely had some moments in that game, and that tells me the Chiefs. Who've, who've had this really good linebacker room of guys like Nick Bolton and Willie Gay and Leo Chanel and Tranquil, to give him that kind of money is telling him probably you're one of our starting two moving forward. Yeah. So big Linda. win to Drew and his family and, yeah, good on him for enjoying that parade. Don't know if he needed to yell out, this is way better than LA to the adoring <laughs> Kansas fans, but, you know, maybe we all know what it's like when emotion gets the better of you in the moment, right, as we get on this show. And what's the what's the roll on effect there for um, Tranquil getting a three year nineteen million deal for us? Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that because actually that's not relevant at all. What was what's relevant for the compensation pick formula is what the Chiefs initially signed him to last year. So okay. when when this kind of formula plays out, the NFL has determined that with all the outgoing free agents we lost last year and all the incoming ones we signed, like Kendricks. That all equaled out to the Chargers getting a compensatory pick for Tranquil, but it's a seventh round pick, actually. It's going to be pick number 253 in the draft coming up. And that represents essentially Tranquil's deal with the Chiefs, which is something like one year, two and a half million or $3 million. So that's how that works. But, you know, talking about some of those intro presses, Joe Horti speaking about how much Baltimore values yes. um, working that system, I think if not this year, next year and the year after, what we'll see is more outgoing internal free agents than we sign externals coming in. So we can really play this mechanism and pick up third, fourth, fifth, sixth round picks every draft. And that buys into the philosophy of it's not trying to find one, two, three free agents. Uh, it's As I said, it's the antithesis, the, the Telesco of signing JC Jackson, of signing Mac, of signing. And it's also perhaps the antithesis of how Brandon Staley uh, experienced his defense. You know, he had studs mm. in Donald and Ramsey. Perhaps we're going to see more of, as you said, uh, the, the Baltimore style where it is rotational guys. You've, you've got to have your Marta Boykes and you've got yeah. to have draft um, and develop draft you know, and your, extend your, Car your yep. Carl Hamilton's those, those centerpieces, but perhaps there's less emphasis and there's less of a gap between the quality of your top and the quality of your bottom, which I've always thought in Telesco's tenure that's always been an issue he's tended to do really well and we've talked about it ad nauseum on the podcast i know he's tended to hit his top picks well but geez i tell you what two middle of two all the way down has been pretty average so uh very exciting speaking of the draft is there anything from the nfl combine that stuck out to you um we obviously saw the the the, the 40 yard dash time fall we've got it is that is that official for 4.21 now 421 for xavier <laughs> worthy from texas beating that is john ross fast. my gosh that is fast it's always fun i mean I, I remember at the start we were a little skeptical about why people are into the combine years ago you know got these guys just sprinting about in in you know scantily clad uh but but now you know you you realize for certain positions coaches have some metrics they want to see you hit either arm length or broad jump or you know 10 yard split what i'm gonna uh what i thought was most interesting from this combine and i'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk some quarterbacks because i don't think we'll cover it in our pre-draft shows is this was the first time i think 
where there is a possibility of four quarterbacks going with the four first four picks of the draft. That's never happened in the history of the NFL. So three on three occasions, QBs have gone one, two, three. Most recently in the 2021 draft with yep. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance. We've never had QBs go one, two, three, four. And where I have my rankings at the moment is, is my favorite quarterback in this class is Caleb Williams of USC. I think he's a number one pick in most years. And the reason why is in, in a NFL at the moment where you're trying to find a guy who becomes a top five quarterback like Patrick Holmes and Herbert, I feel like Caleb's ceiling with his arm talent and his arm strength and his off, off script ability, if he hits, you're talking that potential. So I think that's why you place him at one. I have Drake May as my second favorite quarterback from North Carolina. He has the prototypical at attribute, 6'4", good Gun leader. Slinger. Gunslinger. He's young, but he has quite a few inexplicable misses, whether it's bad accuracy or throwing picks. But North Carolina had an offensive line that was about as bad as Kentucky had with Will Levis last year. So I think that might sort some of his issues out. I have Jaden Daniels at three who's the LSU Heisman Trophy winner. Now, the concern with him is even though he's listed by school at 210 pounds, he looks like he's under 200 uh, and he, he he looks really skinny and he takes some enormous hits for LSU. He just has, he's reckless. He's a great runner. He's a really talented dual threat quarterback. Think mm. of guys, I see him looking like a kind of a Tyrod Taylor floor and a Russell Wilson ceiling. But Russell Wilson's very compact and tight, whereas uh, Jaden Daniels, the concern will be, how does he go when he gets whacked a few times in the NFL and can he stay on the field? And this is a long way of saying, so if quarterbacks do go one, two, and three, if the Patriots decide we're going to take one at three, the talk then becomes these teams like the Vikings and the Broncos and the Raiders, who we know want a quarterback, the Giants even, is there anyone left that they might want to jump up to pick four ahead of us and take? And the candidates are J.J. McCarthy from Michigan, Bo Nix from Oregon, Michael Penix Jr. from Washington. Nix and Penix are both like five-year, six-year college players, so they're a bit yeah. older and yeah. either have injury concerns or years where they weren't very good, like Bo Nix for Auburn. J.J. McCarthy is the opposite. He's young. He's, you know, he's, he's a younger guy who just won the national championship, and he does have really good physical attributes, arm talent. He can scramble. Uh, but in that Michigan Harbour kind of offense, they ran the ball a lot with with Corum and Donovan Edver Edwards. So he has about half of the pass attempts of some of these other guys. Do you think, Jack, a team could, in this quarterback needy world, decide we're going to make this quarterbacks the first four picks of the NFL draft and suddenly the Chargers are sitting there at five <laughs> with Marv Harrison Jr. on the board or Malik Neighbors? I think there's going to be a lot of wheeling and dealing done before we pick at five. If anything, it could be the most wheeling and dealing that we might have seen before we take our pick that early. I put it as a less than 50% chance that there's going to be quarterback one, two, three, four. I just don't think there's enough risk averse people in the NFL for that to happen. It's just such a, a danger to give up so much if you're going to move up to four to take a flyer on McCarthy as well. Um, I mean, Penix threw that huge. I was just in that ball. He threw it like 85 yards. Ooh. Of, I was yeah, he's got, a, he's got a hose. But I definitely think the top three, I think you're bang on. Uh, what order people have them in is up to them. Um, Caleb Williams, I think, is an exceptional. His year at USC, uh, people were down on him, but the team wasn't as good as it was two years ago. Um, he was trying to win on every play. We had an offline conversation about, I'd rather take a guy that's willing to throw picks and perhaps be a little bit more reckless if it means he's going to win. I wouldn't want the guy that's sitting there going, I know I've got my numbers. I'm just going to put this one away. Um, Derek I'm, Carr. I'm a competitor. <laughs> well, he's not going to be listening to this podcast now. We're blocked. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's less than 50%, but there's going to be some movement. If it so happens that between one, two, and three, three quarterbacks go, I have a feeling that Hortiz is going to be on the phone like a maniac and we're going to be d trying to figure out. I th I'd love it if we stayed in the top 12. Mm -hmm. Anything outside of 12, unless we're getting an absolute treasure chest, 
Yep. I, I wouldn't be too excited about dropping anywhere between doing some mock drafts on PFF. I'm finding myself, because they're great indicators of what happens on draft day. Of course it's not. But um, I, I am finding myself in that in that 8 to 12 range. There's still your Bowers. There's still a Oduns. There's still a, a Neighbours in there. Or there's still like a high-end tackle prospect as well. So, yep. yeah, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be super, super fascinating. Well, what do you think? Do you think there's going to be four quarterbacks going before, or before the fifth pick? I think no. I mean, it's never happened before. So uh, even though I do think this is a pretty special quarterback class, I think because you do have Penix and Knicks and other guys who are good, if you're or if you're a team like the the Broncos or the Raiders, you might just sit and hope one of them falls to you in the mid-teens rather than moving up to four. Kevin O'Connell's a chance. I mean, if cousin, Kirk Cousins leaves, yeah. maybe they do. But but I would think they're more likely to come up to pick three and yep. convince the Pats to like push their f- quarterback needs into the future and just give them a treasure t- chest so they can come up to three. Or trade Cousins. Sign Cousins <laughs> and trade him to the Patriots, <laughs> which would be fascinating. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of a preview of the draft shows that we might do. The knowledge that Alistair has, uh, he's been an absolute what do they call it? Tape dog, an absolute tape dog looking at, uh, looking at the college prospects. So that's a little tidbit of what is going to come in the next couple of months. Righty Roo. It looks like we are onto the free agency discussion. So let's refocus listeners. We're going to go back from the underwear Olympics and we're going to refocus ourselves on the charges cap situation. So the first question that we've got to deal with, and I'll throw to you, Alistair on this one. Um, there are many, there's, there are many ways to break up this quad of players, and most people will know what we're talking about here. We're talking about Keenan, uh, Mike Williams, Joey Bosa, and Khalil Mack. What is your feeling based on cap? Uh, let, let's focus on the cap first. What is your feeling? Well, let's start with some very quick basics. The Chargers have until the 13th of March to become what they say is cap compliant. Five At the days. moment... Yep, five days away. So what that means is, according to Over the Cap, at the moment, they are sitting $21.1 million over it and need to find a way to get rid of that 21.1 by that date. They can't trade, is my understanding, in order to achieve that. It has to be either contract extensions or contract restructures, which is converting base salary to signing bonus and essentially pushing cap hits into the future, or it's straight up cutting players. Now, when we get into kind of what we do with some of our internal free agents and external free agents, it's worth knowing, guys, that clearing $21.1 million is I think we might have just lost Alistair there for a little bit. Have you got me back? I think we're back. Yeah, we're back on. Here we go. Okay. So part one is to to clear that $21.1 million. And then after that... That leaves your roster really bereft. If you look at the 51 after that, you've got barely any players. You also need to pay your rookie pool of picks, which is $14 million. You've got to have your practice squad players. That's $4 million. You've got to have an amount for injuries, $3 million. And then you want to pay all of these internal and external free agents we're about to talk about. At the moment, none of them are charges. So to me you're really wanting to not just clear 21 million, you're wanting to clear more like 75 to $80 million, in my opinion, in order to pay for all of those things and fill the roster with free agents and rookies. So to bring that back, what you've got to look at is how can you save money with these these big four players? And if you're going to cut or trade these guys, for Mike Williams, you can save 20 million. For Keenan, you could save 23.1. For Boza, you'd only save 14.38, the way his deal is structured. And with Khalil Mack, the big one, he's going to save you $23.25 million to move him on. And he's, you know, he's 33 years old. So what I think they will do in the next three days, I personally think that cutting Mike Williams makes too much sense to, to get that cap compliance. They don't have to do it that way. If they want to shed that $21 million, you could do some other things like cut Fox, give Keenan a big extension to lower next year's cap hit and push it into the future. If you if you want to keep Mike Williams around to see if you can trade him in April. But what do you, what do you think? I mean, 
if if you can keep some of those four players being realistic and knowing you've got a clear space, are you tearing it all down? Are you trading everyone? And what are you going to do? Well, if you can cast your mind back to the round table that we had at your house, you know my opinion. It's tear it down. Get get rid of it. Um, it aligns with the Harbour Minter way of running a, a, a team. It's very NCAA. No one's better than the other. Um, let's just focus on getting a really good draft haul in this next, the the ne- in the next in the coming months, and then focus on building. We'll make it very clear that we are building. We'll make sure that Justin knows that. We'll make sure that the players we do keep know that, um, and we're going to be very clear in our messaging to some of the vets that we might say, "Hey, listen, this is our philosophy. Um, we're very happy to help you, and if you're willing to help us, but if you're not willing to stick around." Uh, it's time to go. And at some point, these guys are probably going to want to be paid what they're worth. Like, I feel like Mike Williams wants to be paid. He hasn't really been paid what he signed. Keenan, to some extent, I would expect to stay and be a charger for life because of his connection with Justin Herbert. There's a little bit of symbiosis there. If Justin Herbert achieves well, I can also individually achieve well. Um, Bosa and Mac, I wouldn't be surprised if they would disappear as well. I wouldn't be surprised if Bosa goes to somewhere like Detroit um, and Khalil Mack goes to a contender as well, maybe Detroit as well. So um, for mine, I think you're extending Keenan and the rest are disappearing. It's like a fire sale, right? It's like a failed restaurant. Um, One of our good friends, Adam Goldblatt, I'm not sure if he listens to the show, but uh, he's always very big on uh, trying to find secondhand equipment from brand new restaurants that open up, but within the first six months uh, have obviously overcapitalized and they have to shut down. And so you can get some really, really good equipment for very cheap and you can put it into your own restaurant. So Shrewd that's... operator, Goldie. Same same on the poker table when he's hiding <laughs> oh, chips in yes, his pocket. He's hiding chips, that's right. He, so... He's always looking for a leg up on his competition. <laughs> Uh, shout out to Adam Goldblatt. You're a good man. Haven't spoken to you in a while, but uh, giving a shout out on the podcast. So yeah, it's a fire sale. Um, but the biggest thing for me, if walking in, Harbour's confident, Hortiz is confident. Hey guys, this is our five-year plan. Um, you can be a part of it if you want to. Chances are that you're not going to be due to age. So help us help you. We don't necessarily want to keep you around. Um, we're happy to cut you and you can go and find somewhere else because I don't think any of these guys, bar Mac, have trade value. Yep. I, I actually would do the exact same thing. I'll say this is a fringe position. I think very few listeners would want the team to move on from all of Williams, Mack and Boza. But I look at the broader, the, like the, the five-year plan of this team to me does not involve those players. I mean, you think it could involve Boza, but there's just such a question over his mind and his body at this stage. Yep, the, and and, and the, tying it into the discussion we had before about this Baltimore system using its edge players really well and looking for guys who can drop into coverage. Right now, you can shed that 60 to $80 million by extending Keenan, like you said, making him retire a charger. I think it's important that Herbert keeps him for the next two to three years. Mike Williams, good luck, buddy, with your ACL recovery, but you can play elsewhere. And then in the lead up to the draft, we see, is there a team like the Lions who will give you early day three picks. I think we are looking at a fourth, fifth round pick for Boza and Mac, and you're looking at combined savings, 60 million bucks, easily 60 million bucks just for Williams, Mac and Boza. And by extending Keenan, you're going to save more than $10 million on 2024. There you go. You're done. And now you've got about $50 million or $40 million to play with to talk about these internal guys we're about to talk about and buy some external guys to help build the future of the team. And also, uh, I guess the psychology of these guys, Mac was brought in because of his relationship with Staley. Uh, Joey Bosa has seen coach after coach, coordinator after coordinator. If I'm him, I'm sitting there going, am I just getting a free paycheck here? Um, but I don't think Harbour is going to allow that or Hortiz would. Williams has had a number of numerous coordinators and coaches. To be honest, it's, 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 It just makes sense and I'm Mm. not saying, I'm not slighting these players at all because I think they're wonderful leaders. But if you extend them, they're still going to be the alpha dogs. They're still there. There's there's still remnants of Staley. There's still remnants of Lynn, of hell. There's even remnants of McCoy. And at that point, and the one thing that connected all of those players was Tom Telesco. Now he's gone, so who cares about it? It's time to um, cut the strings and say, thank you very much for your service. The NFL is a business. Um, and time to move on, even though it's going to, if it's, it's going to sting a little bit because we might not get the compensation that perhaps we want, but Mm. at the end of the day, um, 
are Joey Bosa and Mike Williams worth? I mean, they're, they're not. Yeah, look look, look at the compensation pick. as cap savings. Correct. It's, That's it will what be it an extra. It will be an extra pick in the draft. So it, what it will mean is suddenly we're probably we have ten draft picks in the draft if we move both those guys, and you've saved forty, fifty, sixty million dollars of space to move forward and make the Brandon Staley experience a thing of the of the of the past. And you know that I've been very vocal on this. All of a sudden, it becomes Justin Herbert's team. Mm-hmm. It's not Joey Bosa's. It's not Mike Williams. It's not Khalil Mack's anymore. You know, though Khalil Mack was very uh, vocal in the way that he led, taking all the whole defense out to dinner and doing all that kind of stuff. That's what Brandon Staley wanted him to do. But now it's Harbaugh and Herbert's team. It's the double H. I think that aligns, yes, with fiscally and what you do strategically with money, but also philosophically, I think that's the way you've got to go forward when you're building teams. Uh, All right, what are we going to do with RFAs? Yeah, so this is very quick. Uh, For the listeners who don't know, restricted free agents, they're, they're players out of contract that have at least three years of accrued service. If you want to keep those players, what you can do is place a tender on them and depending on how much you value the player, you'll either place a first round tender or a second round tender or a right of first refusal tender. Each of those costs a different amount of money. And what it does is essentially gives other teams a chance to pay that amount. And if they do, you'll get draft picks in return. But the only RFAs for the Chargers are the linebackers, Armen Ogbong Bamiga and linebacker Blake Lynch. Neither of them are worth the cheapest tender, which is... $2.82 million for the right of first refusal tender. No. So what you do is you don't tag these guys and maybe you bring them back. You're just going to want to bring them back on a minimum deal, which is 985K in the in the future. So no RFAs and that deadline's about to pass. And let's move on to UFAs, I guess, and what we do. Again, my philosophy is uh, I don't think many of these guys are going to hang around and that's saying something, right? There is a little bit of me that thinks because of the experience of Harbour, the guys, even the rookies that he brings in, when I, when you think of players that, you know, win games or lose games, I think net Harbour wins three games just by having Harbour there. The uh, passion that he brings and the way that he can get buy-in from first year players. Yeah, the talent level is not going to be there, but geez, are they going to play hard? Are they going to play fast? Are they going to believe in what they're doing? 100%. So net, I think that, and I think Justin Herbert off his own back probably wins four games. When I look at that, okay, we're at seven wins already throughout the NFL season Um, with a bunch of first rounders. You've got a, 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 sorry, first rounders, a bunch of draft picks. Um, You might bring in some free agents to steady the ship, but I I think we're sitting at six or seven wins. And if we win that, if we go over that in uh, for next season, I think that's a, uh, that's a bonus. But I look at this list here and I go, I don't know who's going to stay. Um, There's rumors that Austin Eckler is going to go to the fucking chiefs. Um, which is going to be frustrating because he's probably going to have, a, I don't know, 12 touchdowns and, I don't know, 1,500 scrimmage yards if his body holds up. But the rest of them, I don't... I, again, I see a lot of players who have been in this Tom Telesco, Lynn, Tom Telesco, Staley, this old system, and I don't know how much baggage they're bringing with them. What say you? Well, let's talk about five guys. Maybe before I go, you can say if you would keep any of them. I think the five big ones are Austin Eckler, as you mentioned, Kenny Murray, the linebacker, Michael Davis, a corner, Aloe Gilman at safety, Gerald Everett at tight end. Any of those guys, like you just think, it might be as simple as you don't like how the roster looks at that position. Without them, we're too bare. Do you do you invite any of them back on a, on a market deal? Uh it's it's just, it's so hard because the discussion with Gilman is that was he playing in the system very well and you take put him in a new system and he has to learn something new is he is it going to be slow on the uptake because it's taken him all of four years to get to the level where he is now um, now I would keep I would try to keep him as much as possible mm. because I think he's mm. a great pair with Derwin James the rest. I'm probably looking at free agency or doing some trading to get a to get a, yeah. a, a, a Gerald Everett replacement, mm-hmm. um, especially if we're taking Bowers there. I mean, gosh, Bowers could probably step into the tight end one role straight away. It's rest- hard because Everett was such a likable player in terms of the way he played. But, you know, he's 30 years old. He's been playing for $6 million a year. 
PFF reckons his projection is a one-year contract for five and a half million. If he like, if he wanted to play for one year, I would think about it with him just because I do like the fire he brings, which could be good for a hub or type of system. But he's an he's not really a blocking tight end, is he? He's kind no. of a he lines up in the slot. He's a good receiver, but Herbert has that connection with him. If he wants more than a year, though, if a team gives him two, I say see you later. It's so hard to make. I guess, projections here, because again, I'll go back to what I said before. It's just the clear communication and Harbour's going to call a spade a spade and goes, listen, you're more than welcome to stay, but we don't really see you here in three years. Are, are you willing to play? Are you willing to play for a year? I, I mean, we'd love to have you, you know, but mm. realistically you're 30 years old, Gerald Everett. And the way that you play is very bang, bang, you know, from a business perspective, we, your body might not hold up. Eckler, very much the same. If you just said to Austin, if you honestly, I really like the way Austin Eckler goes about it. People would disagree with me and say he's, you know, sort of been a bit of a, I guess a bit of a, a toxic personality, both is sort of in the locker room and how he's portrayed uh, his, or how he, how he has stated the state of running backs and caused a bit of a kerfuffle. Um, mm -hmm. I think all the power to you, mate. Thank you. You're a great charger. Tom Telesco, one of Tom Telesco's best ever draft, or what? He's not even a draft pick, uh, um, uh, a UDFA. Good luck, and and I think that's how you maintain positivity with these players who are who are leaving. I think that's that's the one thing when you walk in as a new person at an organisation, people who are, are have been a bit burnt or a bit upset about what's happened, is you try and leave them on the best possible terms. So then they go out and then they spread the good message of going, hey, listen, yeah, my time at the Chargers was up and down, but I tell you what, you know, that Harbour, that Hortiz, that guy, they're, they're doing something. And you never know what good karma that spreads for yeah. the next round of free agency or the next round of that kind of stuff. So again, that's very meta. What about you? Are, are you yeah, keeping anyone? Well, Aloe Gilman is the most interesting one. And we should give a shout out to our buddy, Kyle, who started his own podcast, the Powder Keg Podcast. We'll still get him back as a guest, um, but he's off on that frolic. And he's what a start. He's had Aloe Gilman join him for a, a really interesting one hour sit down. If you haven't watched it yet, guys, um, we'll post a link in our comments. But he 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 made me like him even more, Aloe, by the end of that. Just a really nice guy who, who's professional, loves his Hawaiian culture, takes football seriously, and he's coming into his own as a guy who's only turned 27 and just coming off the best game, sorry, the best year of his career. I think it will just come down, like you said, Jack, to what he wants to play for. I mean, in the last 48 hours, there have been two safeties signed. Tyron Matthew at 32 years of age, signed a two-year deal for about $14 million with the Saints. So he's going to get about $7, $7 million per year. Taylor Rapp, who's now at the Bills, has signed a three-year deal for 11 or 10.625. So Aloe, his career earnings to date across his career is less than $4 million. He will be looking for a two or three year deal. He'll be saying to the Chargers, hey, Tyron Matthew just got two years for 14 mil. I reckon I played as well as him last year. Taylor Rapp got three. I'm way better than him. And what you think I'm going to come back on what PFF had projected him as just getting a one year deal? I don't know. So the question is, I'll throw a hypothetical at you. If he said, Chargers, I'll come back for two years, seven and a half million dollars. So just under four million a year. I want half of the, half of that guaranteed, and I want to be here for the next two years. It means you don't need to worry about a safety in free agency or the draft. What say you? Uh, I mean, you've got to look at it more than just monetarily whether that's going to fit or not. I mean, does Minter have a plan for him? Is and and, and does he know what seven and a half million dollars a year is going to get Minter? Uh, to be honest, you'd think that. If we're getting rid of the trenches, so you're getting rid of two premier pass rushes purely because of cap issues, you're going to focus on that early on in the draft, I think. And so mm -hmm. there's got to be somewhere on your defense that you can look to and go, all right, I think we're set there for at least 24 months and that's got to be your safety group. So I'd go, yes, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd keep Alohi Gilman around. He's clearly got a relationship with Derman James as well. Um, and maybe... You know, because I because again, cornerback is looking very thin too. So yeah, corners um, you've got need to, a lot you've, of work. You've got to have somewhere in your secondary where you can just not think about and go. Okay, I can just 
not have to focus on that too much uh, because the rest of the defense, I think, is going to need a lot of work. So, yeah. They left I'm a lot of cracks in the plaster old Telesco and Staley to, to fill. Um, uh, yeah. So why don't we get into some external guys then? So what we've done is we've we've extended Keenan. We've actually traded, if possible, Bozer and Mack. We've cut Mike Williams. So presumably you're not going to fill all your needs in the draft. You're going to have to look to external free agency uh, at some positions. I think the Chargers will be shopping at Aldi this year, the discount grocery <laughs> store. They're still going to be looking for relatively inexpensive free agents. I think... Everyone gets excited about Saquon Barkley and Derrick Henry, Josh Jacobs. I think we're probably going to avoid paying a running back 10 million bucks a year. Uh, but I know you've, we've both had a look at the PFF list of external free agents. Are there a couple, Jack, who have stood out to you that you'd like to go after? I've always liked him for when he was drafted the Patriots and it's a Michigan connection and that's Josh Uche. Oh, I, I thought you were going somewhere else. Okay. No, no. I'm going to go Uche, I think. Yep. Um, yep. I, 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 that's another one that I wouldn't mind, mm, but I was going mm -hmm, to start mm -hmm. very far down the list. Um, only 25 and a half years old. He's unsigned. I think, you know, he's got some of his best football in front of him. Uh, again, he links back up with Harbour. Uh, and and I think as, as you know, that he might be the most, the, the, the highest paid edge that we have at, what PFA projects him at 7.25 average a year. Um, you can maybe push that down. He signed to a two-year contract. He might get, I don't know, 6.7 perhaps. You might push that down per year. Uh, and, and I think that's great. Young, athletic, uh, and, you know, sort of a good tandem with Tui Pelotu there. So Uche is my first one uh, that I'd love to see. Nice. If we're going to talk about edge, I like Uche. That's if you want a younger guy to keep around for a while. If you want another guy with a Baltimore connection and you just want a free agent to come in for a year and then maybe play well and then leave and you get a compensatory pick for him, that you can look at a guy who's already been with the Chargers and Kyle Van Noy. But the guy who I wouldn't mind thinking about is Jadavian Clowney. He's 31 years old, coming off a really good season, arguably the best of his career in Baltimore. Uh, he played 747 snaps, so he was healthy. Um, PFF gave him a grade of about 83, and you saw him be disruptive. He, we know he's really good um, in the running game, in run defense. So if you gave him the option of a one-year deal at you know nine million bucks, eight million bucks, I think that works with Hortiz's philosophy as a guy he already knows. And a guy who, if he plays well next year in the defense, then maybe he leaves in free agency the following year and it helps you with your comp pick formula. So I'll start there with the edge group. Yeah, and I guess I was looking at, uh, I guess the one that you were going to talk about is that interior of the offensive line. And that's Michael Onwen. Is How do you pronounce his name? Is it Onwenahu? On, Onwenu? Yeah, Onwenu, yeah. On, Onwenu. Um, I picked him up as a, weirdly enough, when I played Madden a lot before I had I, you know, responsibilities of father and things that I could sit there for hours on end playing it. I always used to draft him and he used to end up being one of my best interior um, offensive linemen there because who knows what the goal is for the offensive line this year. You know, clearly we understand Slate is going to stay where he's at. Clearly we've got Zion Johnson there. Who's a, who's a, who's a strong first round pick. You've got, um, Oh, so yeah. Solia, there we go. I almost said Slater again. You've got Solia there. You've got Pipkins. Um, but what's going to happen? I, I kind of feel like maybe we even save some more money and, and let Pipkins go push Solia out to right tackle so there's a guard spot there that we need to fill. Um, and if we're not going to be super competitive this year, and that's my – I'm sure that's not what they're saying internally, but if it's a year of building – one of my goals as a GM and as a coach would try to be protect Justin Herbert as much as possible. So try to really reinforce that offensive line early with some, with some big boys and also perhaps some guys that are physical in the run game. And I think yep. Onwenu is definitely coming from New England who are always very physical in the way that they run. Um, they run multiple different running schemes, zone and power, um, depending on their opponents. So Onwenu's uh, another one. I'm just picking off Patriots. Mate, there we go. So so Mike Onwenu is my number one target in free agency. I'm going to go as far as saying this is a future Super Bowl winning move, and I would Ooh. throw the absolute bag at Mike Onwenu. I would happily make him one of the higher played guards in the NFL. Now, 
I think you can approach this two ways, Jack, because as you, you pointed out, when you're looking at the future of the offensive line and I, you listen to what Hortiz has been saying, you've got a complete gap at centre with Lindsley retiring and presumably not being comfortable with the guys behind him at the minute. At least they haven't shown enough that you'd want to go with Brendan Hymas. Mm. I think you need to buy in free agency either a centre or a guard because Sawyer didn't play that well and then plug the other hole with a draft pick in your first three or four picks. And when you look at the free agency centre class, Aaron Brewer, Andre James, Lloyd Cushenberry. JPJ. Yes. Oh, which one? Sorry. Right. No, I'm with you. So J- yeah. JPJ is in, the, obviously, if you go to draft, and that's what I would do. So I don't like the free agent centres enough. They're not like Corey Lindsley when we got him. I don't want to give a three or four year deal to the guys who are centre free agents. Mike Onwenu is another former Michigan guy who has played with for Jim Harbaugh. He is six foot three, 250 pounds. He's best suited to a gap running scheme, exactly what they're going to run at the Chargers. He has played in 2022, played 100% of snaps at right guard. Last year, he played 80% of snaps at right tackle. He's also played left guard. This is a guy who can play any spot really, or at least four spots at a high level. And in the four years he's played in the NFL, like his lowest PFF grade is 71.5. He's a guy who's graded in the high 70s and mid 80s. He even had an 87 grade in 2021. With terrible, guy, terrible quarterback oh, players. Terrible well. quarterback play, arguably some terrible coaching by of the offensive coordinators there. So don't overthink it. If it costs four years, $60 million to get this guy. Pay the man. You've created cap space by getting rid of these star players. At 26 years old, that is a foundational piece that it's worth paying in free agency. And then you can look to the draft for your center. So I'm with you, man. Mike Onwenu is my biggest, biggest target for this offseason. Love it. Love it. Well, let's, I'm going to flip over to the other uh, line, and that's the defensive line. And I'm going to take a flyer on Javon Kinlaw. Ooh, I would love okay. to see. I mean, he's he's outside. I think he's ranked number 101 by PFF. He's only 26 years old. Um, yep. Perhaps not hasn't lived up to the the draft capital but he's 320 odd pounds he's six foot five uh he's coming from uh san fran uh which is you know a high performing organization he is he's not gonna want to big money i think pff project one one year for 5.5 million dollars as a big solid rotational piece because the guts are going to be ripped out because there's going to be no uh, SJD. There's going to be no Austin Johnson who are undersized anyway. Let's just get him in and, and let's see what happens. Play play for a contract, play for your next contract. Um, uh, and I wouldn't sign him to anything more than uh, than probably what five-ish, maybe five, five, five and a half is what PFF, um, as mm-hmm. I said, is, is projecting. But let's just get some big meat in there. Uh, that would be my other flyer, which is a really, it's, you know, we're talking, we're bottom of the barrel here, other than maybe on Wenu. But you're going to like, you're going to like him as a guy too. He he came from really humble um, origins. I mean, he, he told stories about his mum used to boil the kettle for hot water in the bathtub, mm. you know, this kind of stuff. He's a really nice salt of the earth guy, as we'd say in Australia. And you know, former first round pedigree didn't work out in San Francisco really, but I don't mind that idea. If we're looking at defensive tackles, which is sneakily one of the real issues with the roster with Nick Williams, Austin Johnson out of there, SJD out of there. Another name is Daquan Jones, the defensive tackle from Buffalo. Again, six foot four, 320 pounds, Jack. He plays anywhere from three technique to zero technique over the nose. He's an older player at 32 years of age, but he's been durable for most of his career. He when he he plays fewer step snaps, but when he does, he can get pass rush and he's a good against the run. So if you just need a guy for a year, he's the type of player to replace a Nick Williams or an Austin Johnson. Uh, I might flip another one at you, Jack. So the Chargers have a real need at cornerback, especially mm-hmm. if Michael Davis isn't signed. And I think they're going to be drafting one with their first three picks probably. Their outside corner room is basically Asante Samuel, Dean Leonard, and Jasir Taylor, right? So why not plug one of these gaps in free agency with a kind of a a cheaper or a value signing a corner? Some names I considered but didn't go with. There's Stefan Gilmore. There's Chidobi Awuzie, Stephen Mm. Nelson, formerly of the Chiefs. A lot of people like Darius Williams, who the Jags just cut and used to 
excel in Staley's system in the Rams, but he's only five foot nine, 187. And with Asante the other side as a lighter framed player, I don't like that. What I do like is Kenny Moore the second, who's a cornerback for the Colts. He's a slot. He plays like a dog despite size limitations. He has some of the more incredible interceptions you'll see, whether it's highlights from training camp or in games. You can move him around. He's played slot outside, dime linebacker in the box. So a bit like when we signed Bryce Callahan, if you want to give him, say, a two-year $14 million deal, make him a $7 million cornerback, which is less than you're playing Michael Davis, suddenly you don't need to worry about slot. Jasir becomes your backup slot and you're looking at using a first, second or third round pick on an outside corner to replace Michael Davis. Um, so that's another one I'd think about. Yeah, the cornerback room I'm very, very worried about because you're not going to, if we're going to go offensive weapon high in the draft, I don't know if, is the cornerback class this year deep enough to get a second rounder at the top of the second, mind you, that's ready to plug and play a cornerback? Is Have, have you found that? Is, are, I, are, is I really like this there? cornerback class, yep. So okay. there'd, there'd be guys at the early second. But, but I mean, we all thought that about Asante, right, who was a second round mm. pick. When you're taking a cornerback who's the fifth or sixth off the board at the start of the second, yes, it's going to be a challenge to expect them to be a CB1 in the NFL yeah, straight okay. away. Yeah, interesting. But I mean, I like some of the value anyway. Yeah, okay. Well, that's going to be a position of yeah deep need, and I, I don't know if the free agent class is good enough. And I'm and people are going to be so burned on the JC Jackson signing. It's like, mm. well, maybe we're just going to have to find other ways to defend. We're paying him twenty million dollars this year not to play. Oh dear. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, thanks, Brandon. Uh, is it worth talking about Patrick Queen? I don't know. I mean, I'd love to have him, but I mean, you're talking close to $20 million a year to have him. The Baltimore connection would be great, uh, but I just don't think that's going to be. And and realistically, if Kenny Murray goes, I think it's time for Diane Henley to take some snaps. And with yeah. the Bowman coaching yep. them, I, I, I was so very, very surprised that Diane Henley did not see the field more last year. I found it very, very peculiar. It's it weird. was almost like they, Tommy Big, Tommy Tickets and Brandon had put a lot of effort into getting Kendricks and um, obviously drafting and moving up in the draft to take K9. They were just hoping that they would, especially K9 would come good. Clearly not. I think he's still, if he goes somewhere else, I think he's still going to be a decent linebacker. Um, but any other any other positions on the defense or offense for that matter that you've had a look at? I think that linebacker one's interesting. Like that, the, the names aren't that good there. That's all. Like I mean, if you, you if you want a Josie Jewell from the Broncos, you could bring him in. Tyrell Dodson for uh, Buffalo, Willie Gay. But I think I think like you said, there's a there's probably the draft. You're going to have to look at the draft for that. Uh, a couple of cheap ones who I would pay and I would bring them in. We're now looking at an even lower tier than the guys we've been discussing. The Jets just cut CJ Uzoma, the tight end. Six foot five, 271. His run blocking grade last year was 74.5. He also won't affect your compensatory formula because that does not impact guys you sign who were cut because they're not true free agents. So the tight end room at the moment is, you know, Donald Parham, Stone Smart. That's it if the team doesn't keep Everett. So you're not going to address all of that in the draft. So CJ Azoma. Uh, running back is another position the team will need. Mm -hmm. Kelly's a free agent, so it's going to be Spiller and no one else. I say bring in Zach Moss from the Colts. He, uh, he played at Utah for three years with our new running backs coach, Kiel McDonald. Last year when Jonathan Taylor went down, he came in and had about 800 yards and five touchdowns as a backup running back. He's five foot nine, 205 pounds. So think short, stocky, good burst through the hole, but kind of limited wiggle or long speed. So he'll just get you that kind of four or five yards. But I like him in a gap system. So he, you know, in the, the Colts had him in zone system for most of the time. I feel like he would suit what Greg Roman wants to do. And he had no fumbles last season. So that's another good thing. So Zach Moss, CJ Ozoma, they're a couple scraping the bottom of the barrel. It'll be fascinating. And the free agents that we get in will give some idea about how perhaps Ortiz and Harbour are building. 
it'd be yeah it's are we going to get a couple of over 30 guys who are experienced to come in and 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 teach and train and are they happy to do that again we talk about the messaging and clarity of plan and clarity of what they want in the next five years or if we're just going to go if we are going to sign guys that are sub 30 who are hovering around that 25 26 perhaps they're going to be perhaps longer contracts because they see them as being a part of the, the Super Bowl window. Um, of course, the window is always open, but yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fascinating to see how everything works. And I think more so than ever before, we're going to get more of an idea about the direction of the, of, of the organization with Tom. It was always, Oh, because I know I'm personal, I call him Tom. Um, with with Telesco, it was always quite challenging to see the direction because Bar, you know, after his six years GM, he's probably always going to sit down and go, well, I think the Super Bowl window is always open. It, there's no such thing as a rookie window, uh, a, a rookie quarterback window. What are you talking about? Because he's, he's on the hot seat. So you, that's the messaging you've got to say. But um, I, of course, no one's going to come out and say we're, we're aiming to lose. But at the same time, the, the words and I guess people we can really look out for the words that Harbour uses and Hortiz uses is it development is it growth is it um or is it win now win now we're going to perform this is what we're going to do the harmony of that is truly challenging because you've got to in the NFL you can't just you're sailing a ship you can't just dry dock the ship for a year and then you know change the engine change the sails um, you know, change the crew. You've actually got to change things as you're going. You know, you've got to sail a sailing ship and Staley's kind of left it in a half. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to call it, it's still in the age of sail. And, you know, you've got to take out the superstructure. You've got to take out the sails, put in an engine. You've got to then put in a propeller. You've got to change the drip. So that's a very challenging thing to do at an organization. So um, I guess the long and short of it is, it'll be fascinating in the next 24 months to see where we're going. I'm not expecting too much, but I would be expecting growth and development. Yeah, and I but I wouldn't shortchange like the, the possibility that it turns around a little quicker than you think if they can get those trenches right. Because you do have Justin Herbert and you do have a few good players like Keenan and Derwin. You can always surprise teams. I mean, no one thought the Bucks would make the divisional round this year. Things can change quickly. But like you, mate, I feel like you're going either of two roads in external free agency either longer term deals for young guys, as you've said, or one year deals for old guys, where it's just like, we need a safety. We need an edge. We don't have any on the team. We can't draft everyone. Clowny, you're in for it one year, you know, something yeah. like that. And it's all going to happen within the next five days or, or week. So it'll be I know. exciting. But Get ready for those phone notifications I to go off every two seconds. Don't you think though that that's kind of counterintuitive to trying to build an organization at the same time if you're just getting mercenaries in? You know, you might have you might have an army to fight a battle with, but they're very quickly, you know, halfway through the halfway through the fight, they just turn around and go, oh, "I'm no longer interested." What impact does does that have on the younger guys? And I guess that's the that's the harbor. That's that's yeah, the that's what it took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, that's the culture, right? That's the. The environment is what I've been told to say by certain people. Culture is a ephemeral. You talk about the environment because it's the, it's the biochemistry between people's minds and passion. Anyway, there we go. Uh, anything else from you? Because uh, that's a good hour and 10 minutes. We've had a good chat. It's just been a pleasure to return. You have the five weeks off. You enjoy doing all the other things in your life, but the NFL persistently and voraciously moves on. Uh, and now, you know, we get to do a bit of off season stuff and then get another break in May and June. It's good to be back talking with you, dude. And it will be is. good when Andy joins us soon. Yes, it is. It's hard not to get excited. I, I, I said to myself and the listeners will probably remind me, is like, I'm not going to get excited for at least two years, but I tell you what, being back in the booth and then hearing you, you know, talk about the draft prospects and the, then talk about Harbour and looking at it. It's hard not to be excited. Uh, but perhaps like. Fiken, Ficken, Fuken. We're just, we're excited, but we're just going to take things slowly. Maybe that's our third year. That's our experience coming into play now. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Good to go. No, great to be Done. back. And I know some of the listeners were concerned we, uh, we would, we'd been gone for too long. So don't worry, Athea and others. We're back and we're going nowhere. Yeah. Andy, can't wait to have you back, mate. Uh, the show's not the same without you, uh, obviously. 
we will reiterate our messages we have to start thinking of all of you think of all our listeners um and you guys in the us are coming into summer we're going into winter so enjoy spring we're going to enjoy autumn see you soon for the thunder down under ciao Turning, got it, 6 a.m., 10, 5, high step, touchdown, San Diego!